Good evening and welcome to the City of Montpelier Development Review Board, uh, our meeting for Monday, March 19th, 2018. My name is Dan Richardson. I'm the Vice Chair and Acting Chair this evening. The other Development Review Board members from my right are... Jack Lindley. Kevin O'Connell. James Lamonda. Sarah McShane, staff. Roger Kranz. Kate McCarthy. Okay, uh, first item of business is the identification of the five, motor, five voting members who will be participating in this evening's decision. Um, we actually do have to decide that because there's one member. I'm happy as chair to recuse myself and just simply uh, let the, shepherd the meeting, but let the other voters, uh, members vote on the proposal, if that's okay, unless someone else had a conflict. That's fine. Okay. Next item of business is approval of the agenda. Uh, does anyone have either an addition to the agenda or a motion to approve the agenda as printed? So moved. Motion by Kevin. Second. Second by Jack. Any further? Uh, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And we have an agenda. There are no comments from the chair. The next item is the minutes from our February 20th meeting those present were myself, Kevin, Jack, Roger, James, and Kate. Do I have either a motion for the minutes to be approved or um, a correction or addition? Uh, I move approval of the minutes. I'll second. Motion by Kate, second by James. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. We have minutes approved. <laughs> So the first item of business is for Spring Street. Uh, this is the Jailhouse Commons. This is a nine-car parking addition. My understanding is, Sarah, that they wish to have this continued. Yeah, you should have an email on your desk um, requesting that it be continued. Um, they're still working out whether they can gain access to the side yard through uh, whether it's... Um, whether they can gain access to the side yard for the parking area through the two existing buildings. So they've requested that it be continued to April 23rd, which isn't a regular DRB meeting. Um, the regular DRB meetings coming up would be April 2nd, April 16th, or May 7th. Uh, it's a pleasure of the board. I would say let's, let's go with May 7th. Uh, Okay. Rather than trying to second guess moving it forward. Sure. Acceptable to everyone else? Yes. Yeah, I'll second that motion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ke motion by Kevin, second by James uh, to continue the uh, for Spring Street application until May 7th. Uh, any further discussion? May Here? 2nd, sorry. Sorry. Is it May 2nd or 7th? 7th. 7th. Sorry. Sorry. Seven. April 2nd, May 7th. Right. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Thought I had that right. Sorry. Um, I apologize. Okay. Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor of the motion, please raise your right hand. We are moving along at a swift and even pace. Uh, the next item of business is 1012 and 16 Main Street. This is the Thomas J. Moat Revocable Trust in the city of Montpelier. Gentlemen, if you like to step forward. Is this under the new rules or the old rules? This is our very first application under this the new rules. This is new. Okay. Observe the chair is showing his daughter a good time tonight. <laughs> you can never start off with your civic obligations too soon. <laughs> So this is a continuation from, I believe, two meetings ago. Um, and everyone here was put under oath, except Steve. Steve, you're a new, a new face. So why don't, we, why don't we put you under oath to begin with? You saw, and the remainder will, you all understand, you remain under oath from last time. You solemnly swear or affirm that the evidence or testimony you're about to give for the matter under consideration shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under pains and penalties of perjury. Yes. Okay. So, uh, Sarah, do you want to just update the board as to where things stand, um, and then, actually, sorry, let me s just, for the record, if you could just go around and introduce yourselves at the table, uh, and who you represent. 
Jay White, all I trust. Jeff Tucker, engineer. Steve Rivlaney, and I'm working with Jay on this project. Hey, Fraser, city manager. Uh, John Riley, I'm an attorney here from the city. Thank you very much. So Sarah, if you want to just give us a quick update. Sure. Um, so if you guys remember, uh, this application was first on the agenda February 20th, and it was continued um, pending a few a uh, few revisions to the site plan um, and then continued discussion of the major site plan criteria. Um, we went, it is, as Jack mentioned, or John, uh, Kevin, it's the first application the board's reviewing under the new ordinance. Um, so um, on February 20th, uh, we went over the general standards and the major site plan criteria. And in your in the staff review, I tried to, rather than repeating everything that we um, reviewed on uh, February 20th, I tried to highlight in in red um, the items that were kind of uh, left uh, as um, potential discussion items for tonight and things that had questions. Uh, DPW has provided comments, and you should their incorporate their comments are incorporated in the staff review as well as I think uh, they should might be printed off as an, in the email form too. Um, so if you want, would you should we go through like the? Um, yeah, let's let's start off with the unless the applicants. If you have have you had an opportunity to review any of the staff comments? Um, if you'd like to make a presentation to start off, and then otherwise we'll just make sure we hit each of these particular area. We won't have to march through like we did last time in, in rigorous format. Um, I think we can focus in on the specific areas. Perhaps, if I may, um, as Sarah just said, we, we, we sat down with, um, with the staff, including Sarah, um, Public Works Department people and stuff, and we went through all of the review comments. The you know the big ones were uh, landscaping, accessibility, parking space, lighting, and uh, there were a handful of other you know more more minor. We want to talk a little bit about you know, the, the bike rack mm -hmm. and what we've done. And a suggestion made at this board. So we feel that we've been we were able to successfully address everything. So we updated the plans, but like I said, we sat down for you know, a good hour or two and went through things in detail, face to face, updated plans and sent an updated package in a couple of weeks ago. And uh, staff was, as I understand it, was able to, to kind of back check, if you will, their comments. And, and I guess we feel that we've kind of hit the nail on it and, and addressed everything. And Sarah's got some things here. And we, uh, couple of questions for the board. But from, from our perspective, we're, we, sh we should be pretty close as, as we go through here tonight. Okay. Certainly we're looking for approval Proof. tonight. Everyone, if we can. Can. Everyone always is. Sure. Um, <laughs> so Sarah, if you had specific questions, sure. do you think are still sort of Sure. Um, or yeah. Um, so one of the things as as I learned the new ordinance is everyone becomes more familiar with it. Uh, last time we had a discussion about um, the setback requirements for parking areas and um, the figure in the ordinance requires that parking areas in this district be set back five feet. Um, uh, I kept researching the new uh, some provisions and um, as you if you remember this so this parking area is this continuous parking area um, that leads directly into the adjacent parking area so um, uh, there is a provision in the ordinance that I think addresses this section that I didn't highlight last time or um, so if you get to um, it's section 3011-J um, it talks about sites with non-conforming parking and loading areas and how they're um, how they need to come up to uh, conformance um, to the maximum extent feasible given physical characteristics of the lot and the existing development when there's going to be an increase in the amount of parking or a change in location and such. Um, I think this section addresses this situation since it is a continuous access serving not only this parking lot but the other adjacent rear parking areas. Um, and so that's something we can discuss. Um, so your understanding is that 
3011J uh, essentially addresses this type of non-conforming because if the board remembers last time we were simply concerned because it talks about a five foot side yard setback. It isn't the rear, it isn't the front, but it's the, it's the side yard setback. And so 3011J really talks about existing non-conforming parking allowed being allowed to remain mm -hmm. and since none of the changes that that are being proposed really affect that section of the parking area yeah um, I think given the existing conditions I think this um, this provision I feel comfortable that this provision is is intended to cover these kind of situations in these kind of existing conditions where it's a shared access it's not necessarily a shade or shared parking area but it's um, there's uh, other parcels have access through the lot. Right. I mean, there's, there's first of all, there's the sort of land use obligations mm -hmm. with the access, and then there's the um, it's a sort, of, sort of contiguous parking mm -hmm. where cars are allowed to pass through. Where it's not as if on the other side of this boundary line there's field and yard. questions from the board or concerns all right and then um, the next staff comment is the about the channelization um, yep and I think the board felt comfortable um, last time based on Jeff's um, Jeff's testimony about the river being channelized at this location and that um, the regulations are pretty don't provide any guidance and definition or anything like that um, and so if it is considered channelized there the remaining provisions of that section don't apply yes I'm willing to go with that interpretation um, because as I said last week I think this is a functionally channelized area but I am left with questions about the original intent of this area of the river and how it was meant to be treated you know our job is to interpret not to rewrite and so um, taking your testimony um, I will go with the pleasure of the board on this one uh, while flagging that for whatever that's worth sure. I, I, you know um I thought about this after the meeting, and it really is one of those things where, I mean, the first rule of interpretation is look to the plain language. And, mm -hmm. you know, when you have an ambiguous term like channelized, um, that I don't think readily uh, resolves to a dictionary definition, um, you know, I think we, we build upon it. And so what we're saying here now is where something like this, where functionally the river is controlled, um, on its banks, mm -hmm. um, we would consider for these purposes channelized, not strictly a stone wall against the side of the riverbank. Um, but I'm sure we'll be faced with different challenges down the road where there will be other circumstances which will cause us to be more nuanced. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, <coughs> so the next is about the the next staff comment is about the the pavement. Um, so the revised site plan talks about new bituminous concrete pavement. And that was an item just flagged at right. during the last review that we weren't we were unsure of the material. And is bituminous concrete? And I apologize for my ignorance on this. So it, it, how is that different than asphalt? That is asphalt. Okay, that's, that's more of the scientific design. Uh, the next item is about snow storage and where is the snow storage to be located on this site, Jeff? Well, the, there's on average approximately, if you're looking at the site plan from the edge of the pavement back to the top of the bank, is approximately or, or an average width of about 20 feet. Narrow, it's 19, it's a little over 20. So, you know, we've got some, some very highly tolerant, uh, salt tolerant species and plantings. We're, we're planting that whole bank, you know, that upper portion of that bank. And, and it's either going to be going there or, or chopped off. Okay, so, so, and that will be a, a decision. 
really by, um, I mean, that, that would be an obligation. and You wouldn't have a problem with the condition in the permit that requires either storage at the site or once it started to overflow, especially given that there's a, a passage easement that there be a requirement that the snow be trucked off. Oh. I'm sorry, are you envisioning the snow being pushed in between the trees by the plow? Or is there, are well, you looking at the, a gap there in the middle? The, the larger trees are not right up tight to the, to, to the park. There's a little bit of space there with some of the smaller shrubbery and things like that. And so, yeah, if you dump on the shrubs, it could, could potentially be. Who, who owns the land? Is that city land? City parking? Is there a city parking? It will be a private parking. Private parking? Once this is, once so this the city is. has no responsibility for snow removal. Well, that may, not legally we may contract that may be part of an arrangement with them. But that's I mean, the city will be plowing the right of ways, so we may reach an agreement with them so to do so. It'll but it'll be a combination of the city and private. Kind of like what we had uh, in other yeah. places. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other questions? You look like you have a concern. I have concerns. I'm not sure how to articulate them. We we don't often approve a snow storage area that where the, I don't think when there are um, trees in the way. The shrubbery I'm a little less concerned about. I do hear that it is um, salt tolerant. I read the memo from Sophie. Um, it could others remind me if this is a typical location for snow storage amongst trees and shrubs. I'm the newest. Not, I mean, you know, we get two types of snow storage areas. One are, you know, places where you're going to store the snow all winter. You know, mm -hmm. like when San Augustine's did, they, mm -hmm. they had a proposed area where they weren't planning on putting any trees or anything, mm -hmm. where they were just pile, pile, pile. And then, you know, in a big area like this, I mean, realistically, um, I mean, how's it being plowed now? It's, is it being stored on site or is it being trucked off? I think mostly, you know, it's, it's the current combination. It, it's plowed immediately and then usually cleaned up later because, you know, when it, once it starts building up, you're, you're covering the parking spaces. So right. it usually becomes a function of there's only so much you can, you know, same with our, our parking lots up back here. We might plow them up against the bank for a little bit, but then we've lost a whole bunch of parking, as Steve knows. So then a couple nights later, we come and clean it out so that we can get the full function. We haven't talked specifically about those details, but it's got to support access ways through and private parking. It's, it seems to me that it's got to, you know. We've got 20 feet, if I understand this plan, between the trees, <coughs> probably the lot line. Is that right? Approximately, yes. I mean, that's a lot of snow. Yeah. Well, I thought I heard you say 20 feet between the edge of the parking and the edge of the bank. Mistaken? No, you're, you're correct. 20 feet between the edge of the parking and the edge of the bank. Drop off the bank, yes. but they're not so the not trees. 20 feet between the edge of the parking and the trees. Well, a tree. I don't have my ruler, so I'd ask the engineer to tell me that these little circles with big circles with trees. I'm not shrubs. God bless them. I think I'll get the same as the trees. But I mean, it looks like 20 feet to me between the trees and the edge of the parking lot. Right. And I don't have my ruler either tonight, but I would be a little more conservative and probably say there's, there's up to about 10 feet or so from the edge of the asphalt to about where the large trees take. I mean, I think the, 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 there's two obligations here, Kate, as I, as I see them. Uh, you know, there's a snow storage obligation, mm -hmm. that they're making representations that they'll sto store it in this site till it becomes unmanageable. And then move it, move it away. Have it trucked off with front loaders and, and dump trucks. Um, and then the other obligation is the landscaping obligation. Um, so, if they I recognize that the applicant has an interest in not ruining the landscaping. Right. I understand yeah. that. Having to kill everything so you plant it every year. That's that'd be no fun. Not very cost effective. It's okay. a try. It's a trial to see if it can handle it, but. Sure would be. Looks yeah. like there's should not be any concern that's being dumped into the river or something. Like the idea, it's there. 
get it out here and we get it to most of the parking lots around. And it's well taken care of. Well, I appreciate being able to look at that a little more closely with the group. Thank you. Okay. Anything further about the snow storage? Um, I think it just would be helpful to demarcate that in any final um, draft so that it's, it's, it's marked. Um, we'll obviously, in a written decision, have that as a condition um, and call that out. But um, we generally tend to want the, the site plan to reflect <coughs> bike racks. Where is the proposed bike rack? Mentioning earlier. Well, where it shows up on the plan is in this corner, over here, coming right off the bridge. And there was discussion on, you know, uh, with, with staff and, and, and owners and such as, you know, that where it makes sense. And that's certainly one place to put it. And that's where we ended up. We had talked, we discussed at the, the, the meeting we were here last time, perhaps out closer to the sidewalk and stuff. And, you know, perhaps, you know, so I can speak to that a little bit, but I think the, what I recall anyway, putting it out as an obstruction on the sidewalk, city sidewalk, may or may not make sense. So we ended up putting it here. And I think, as I understand it, we're open to different locations. We did show. How's the board here? Put it in here. Yeah, this is long, yeah, as long as you have. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to criticism day. for I feel bike. differently. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, um, I, um, I agree with Corey, uh, staff advisor, the bike ped committee's recommendation that it should be in a, a, a more obvious location. Um, that's consistent with an observation I made at our last meeting as well. Um, it looks like the sidewalk in front of the building is, is it up to 12 feet wide in some places? Yeah, um, so I, I'd be really, I, I believe that the city sidewalks are narrower in many other places um, and other cities as well, but uh, manage to accommodate very simple, even very simple bike racks like the ones that look like this. Can you see it? It's an upside down U. They take up very little space. So even if there were just two of them, I think that would send a, a really great signal. And if it were possible to save money by doing it at the same time as any other um, any the other sidewalk restoration, that would be really ideal and hopefully make it palatable. I think our message is we're happy to put bike racks in. We think those could work. I mean, the, the, the DRB had suggested this location, and we did get pushback from the DPW that, for lots of reasons, they weren't as obvious, and actually a concern that creating an expectation that this is where you park to use them, you know, um. like this is private parking. So I think I'm talking about my city hat on more than my applicant hour. I think we, we we are more comfortable somewhere closer to the front, either in here we like those new shaped ones, or if there's just space in the sidewalk, or the property. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's again I'm accused, but my my sense is that our con my concern was that there be a bike rack only because there was just likely to be bike traffic. Um, because of this, this area. Where it's located may change over time. Um, <clears throat> and it may, it may be driven by, you know, the, the building owner, it may be driven by the city, it may be driven by, you know, uh, citizen uprisings. Um, any of those will, will probably be more responsive than we can be at this point. You know, we're trying to plan for how people are going to behave on a bike path that hasn't been built yet. Um, I think, you know, if we get, so I, I, I agree to a certain extent with, with you, Kate, that um, it makes sense to have it out front, but I think that will come. I think I'm happy, I'm satisfied for the purposes of the application that there is a bike rack included, that there's been some planning about it, and it's, it may not be in the best location, um, but it is within the plan, and then it, the applicant understands that you know it that may need to move over time. Um, they're not that easy to move, though. They're they're in the ground with concrete. Some of them are. 
He must have a bigger pry bar than I do. <laughs> well, no, he <laughs> got plowing issues. Look, I walked a bike path last year, so I don't remember a bike rack the whole length from the high school down to the to the bridge. There aren't any amenities between the high school and the bridge. There are places people would want to stop in town. I think is is my sense. These are exercises. They don't want to be shopping. But they get hungry. No, I think that's Jack, my own experience Jack, biking through communities. Well, then put it down toward the bridge if they want to walk. Yeah, I mean, if you, but if you're you going to mess up the the snow plowing and the sidewalk plowing, if you put it in concrete in front of the building, we already put parking meters in front of the, in the concrete uh, in front of buildings. Listen, the snow plow doesn't go over the parking meters. No, it doesn't. But how are you going to get by the bike racks? I just going to collect. I mean, it's a disaster. I, I'm, I guess I'm seeing them as analogous and thinking that there are probably solutions for the placement of the bike rack to comparable the to the parking. The plow, whether he would be happy we should. That should be part of it. Okay. That should I be mean, part I mean, of there's it. There's all kinds of creative solutions. I've seen towns where they will actually weld the bike rack onto the um, onto the parking meter. Mm -hmm. um, there's I, the, the bike rack I'm thinking of is more like it, what's in front of us. The outdoor swimming pool here, the metal one that can be moved around. Oh yeah, I see um, what you mean. As opposed to the the, the permanent one. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I think these solutions will, in some ways, be market driven. Um, just I mean, the only comment that I can make is that the distance from Main Street to the back part is 200 feet. Yeah. Uh, two miles, 200 feet. <laughs> so, within this 200 foot range. Once the bike path gets constructed, I think we can kind of figure out where the best place to put it. It's just hard to look at this and try to actually make sense where that might make sense to put it. Yeah. I guess I just the last thing I'll say, it, and I will be a little bit of a pest about this, is that people value parking in front of their stores for cars. Um, I think valuing parking in front of stores for bicycles may also be something that business owners value, but I'm not a business owner. Um, that is just my sort of experience with planning and with being a resident of a downtown. So, I, would, so I, I guess my question, so I, like I said, we on staff also agree that closer to Main Street is better. Like the real question I have is, you know, if we are talking about moving the bike rack around, mm -hmm. um, are we, would we, we or they be in a position of having to come back for an amendment to a site plan just to move the bike rack? Well, can you total flexibility? Yeah, no, I, as long as you have a bike rack. be that there is a bike rack in the project. Yeah, I, I, I well, I mean, th there's a couple of, that's a very good question, and uh, I mean, we could frame it in that way, um, that, I mean, is, is there for any particular reason, and I'm just looking at it right here, why this, this green, the sort of greenscape area underneath the tree by the front, towards the front of the building, why that, where the, the bike path ends at Main Street, why that couldn't, um, House a, a bike rack? That would be a prime consideration, I think, from our perspective. Are you talking about this spot, or are you talking about over here? I'm talking, well, so if you look just in this spot yeah, right here. Yeah. Well, that's a city question. Sure. <laughs> Is it near the big tree there? It's near the big tree. Oh. Right. I mean, it. Right adjacent to the sidewalk? Yeah. Oh, right. right there where there's those four shrubs. Yep. I mean, I say we. I, I want. Get final say from DPW, but I think for, from our perspective, we think closer right. to the street is better. I mean, I think that makes that makes sense, and and it may be again, it's not. This is maybe where I get uncomfortable. Is I don't want to necessarily micromanage and like right there, and but at the same time, I mean, it, it's it seems like that might be a good spot. May not have a huge bike rack there. May not have space for it. But something that is there is is more likely to be used for the reasons I think we've all been articulating than something that's further back here. Understanding that the idea is to discourage um, people from parking and using this as a launching area for their bike bike adventures. Mm -hmm. um, what might make sense is to just let, as a condition. Uh, the bike that be uh, cited in the, uh, in the as built in consultation with DPW and the city's bike committee, and just leave it at that. 
That way we're not trying to micromanage or yeah. minor detail. Well, that actually leads me to my next question, and I did not read the Times Argus article on the um, bike committee, but is this, is that, is the bike traffic committee that, are they looking at this question actively or if they, in the future? Believe, I don't believe they're looking at exactly where the bike rack falls on this project. They are looking in general at bikeways throughout the community and having more bike racks in strategic locations and all that kind of thing. I think, I don't believe they would actually cite, I mean, you could ask them to, but they haven't taken up exactly where this goes. Corey Line is the advisor to that. The only reason I ask is they just happen to have a picture of this very intersection on with the accompanying the but article, the, which the whole intersection is certainly a critical right. intersection under study. Um, so. I, I don't think I think Kevin's suggestion is a, is a good idea to have give it give some flexibility to this, given that this is sort of an on um, that they may be looking. At these issues, um, and that we're, you know, we're looking. I think the the feedback from the applicant is not in front of the building for a number of reasons, um, including. Well, the, the space in front of the building would be a city-owned sidewalk. Right. That other area that you see, I believe, is raised, so it's a raised. So it would be hard to put a bike rack up. Right feet off the ground, so it would have to go on city sidewalk, so it would be back to the city question. See, all, all the proposed areas for the bike rack so far are on city property. Right, but um, in the city, I mean, the city as the applicant is saying, DPW is telling us not on the sidewalks. And, well, I mean, I think there's plowing issues in it, you know, definitely, and, and we have to, we have to work with that. You know, I, I, I mean, Obviously, everyone wants to get this right, and we are yeah. also functioning in the public interest and want to have the bike path and the bike rack in the best possible place that it serves the most utility. Right. What? We're, we're in common. I mean, I think the example that, that Kate's getting towards, which is the idea of, you know, a city like Burlington, if you look at their bike path, there are clear areas that people have started to develop use and this is where they stop, and so, you know, the city is responsive to that by putting bike racks there, but it's really determined by use, as, as you know, you're, as you noted, that stretch from the, from the public, public utility commission building all the way back down to the high school, nobody stops there because there's nothing to stop and see, but if we suddenly put in a bike path right into the heart of downtown Montpelier, people are going to use it to stop. And they're going to stop to get all kinds of things, refreshments, shopping, whatever. Um, and so I think that's that part of this will work itself out because it's going to become a problem. If there's not enough bike racks at certain areas, people are going to be piling things up and there's going to be complaints and there's going to be a need. to parking meters and everything else. Exactly, exactly. Front doors, who knows. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think what we're looking for is just that given our our ability to look at this this particular project at this particular point um, I think we're all in agreement that we like the bike rack it's just a matter of where it's to be located and the question is do we want to go with Kevin's idea or does how does the board feel as far as Kevin's idea I support Kevin's idea I mean this is this is a question build it will they come and where will they come and, and I think the city's smart enough to be reactive to that, but I don't think it should hold up a project of this magnitude, which is a entry building into the city of Montpelier. We just have faith. Kevin, could you repeat your proposal, please? Um, once we have an as-built um, representation that the uh, bike rack be the situated after consultation with DPW and the city's bike committee. Sounds great. Good. Let's move on to the next 
which is the location of the pedestrian walkways um, connecting the proposed rear parking area to the building entrance. So, we're, so I see that the addition has been to add the, the walkway from the bike path to the parking lot area, that highlighted yellow. And then how do we think that the, um, uh, flow of the people coming out of the cars in the parking area to go to the building is going to go? Is that going to be delineated, any type of crossing? So I think that was the other part of that pedestrian. Right, and that was centered on accessibility. Mm -hmm. and when we sat down, and Sarah, please correct me if I'm, I'm mischaracterizing this, but when we had sat down together um, by putting the, um, the, the second accessibility parking, you know, right here under the building, then having separate, um, you know, walkways and stuff in the parking lot itself went away. So we're not proposing that. Well, I know, and Sarah, if you can correct me on the um, on the comments that DPW has provided, it's just they would like to see uh, an accessible connection at uh, I think they call it at at STA 21 plus 75. There's a walk at the other side of the building, but would need to see the MOAT site plan to ascertain whether a crosswalk is needed. Reserving judgment on this. Mm -hmm. So DPW had two comments. They had one about the uh, the highlighted gravel walking path, the five foot walking path connecting the bike path uh, to the parking area, and their comments on that that were that they would prefer that it be paved and that the curb removed on the parking area side just to allow accessible ac accessibility for that. Mm -hmm. And then their second comment um, dealt with, I, and Jeff, you might be able to correct me, but I believe it, they have it referenced as station 21 plus 75, which is my understanding is at the rear of the building, um, whether um, and I think they wanted to see uh, a break in the landscaping and a break in the curb to allow um, accessibility from the rear of the rear of the building um, to the bike path and and to the parking area as well. Is that is that how, I think how you, you understand? You get the stations it? and everything correct. Yeah. Yes. Putting in a right a, a crosswalk, you know, right here off the back end of the building. My understanding is the way that we left that was it was just an ongoing conversation. It wasn't a you know, directive mm -hmm. or anything, and it, and it didn't really fall into the, the, the purview, you know, of this. And it was something that could be added in, that the, because it's a city-owned street, um, you know, the city and the public works could add that in at any time prior to construction. So now, what was I didn't take that as uh, as a directive to put put that in. in, in and what is this crosswalk serving exactly um, at, the, at this particular area? I think the, the, the thrust of the conversation was, you know, if you had people in this area, and, and similar to here, and the reason that we put, just coming back to the little five-footer, you know, back to the back end of the parking lot, was if you had people, you know, kind of walking this way, Main Street, behind the buildings and such, that there's a defined place for them to go. So we had a, we, we all concurred with that, so we got a nice little five foot wide pave, you know, make sure there's no curbs and stuff. Then the conversation went, well, what if you got people down here on this side? How would they get across the street and onto the bike path? You know, it's just kind of helter-skelter, perhaps, or do we put in a, a defined crosswalk in, in an accessible crosswalk? Um, and, um, I mean, there is one right here, at Main Street. It's accessible. There is a defined crosswalk, and you can get from here and crossed, and then on to the to the bike path. So, this is like a hundred feet or so down the road, or, or, or up the street rather than the back end. So it was discussed, um, and certainly, you know, there wasn't any and no reason not to. Uh, it's just the way that I, I guess, I left the conversation as I wasn't sure if that was final decision. It just seemed to be. 
mm. something to talk about, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. Sarah, what was your take? Was it a, was it a conclusion that um. DPW wanted something in there, or something they were going to consider more? Is what I, I take. Away. To be honest, I'm not quite sure. Um, I know there was discussion about just making sure that there was an accessible route to the building and that and the part the accessible parking areas and making sure that um, someone can have clear access to those areas. Um, and we do. But and maybe a way of, of just making making sure that that rear uh, that rear sidewalk the corner of that is ADA compliant maybe in case in case someone needed access there as well as that in that general location a break in the landscaping because I do I'm not sure if they thought that a crosswalk was warranted at this time or but possibly in the future right. but maybe if it be designed to be accessible and then if if a crosswalk is needed, then I guess DBW would address that at that time or something. I thought you were going to say something. <laughs> I was. I was just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are they there? Uh, let's take up the first issue. I think the easier one, which is the DPW is suggesting that this uh, five foot gravel walking path be paved and curbed so that it's accessible. Is there any objections to having that incorporated? I, I think that makes sense. Um, so the real issue is, is whether this sort of uh, what I would almost call a midpoint crosswalk, and given that we're only talking about 200 feet, this is uh, looks about that. Uh, 100 feet back, having having some form of a crosswalk um, to the corner where the dumpsters are located. I mean, that's that's already going to be is, is that a, that's going to already be a low curb, right? Because of the how the the trucks would come. I mean, you're not going to have a high curb where the dumpsters that's, would be. That's correct. Um, so really almost what we're talking about is from the city's point of view, from their side, and then the possible painting of a demarcation of this as a crosswalk um, more than anything else, um, just as, a, as an extra point. And it seems like it's something DPW is not necessarily wedded to, um, but what's the pleasure of the board? Is, is this is this just uh, the the crosswalk that's proposed? Yep. There, it, I mean, it, what what's what is it? I mean, is it just kind of some lines on the road, or it would be lines in the road, and it would presumably be a break, a, a lowering of the curb there, and a break between the shrubbery or trees. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so it would be yet another access point along this, which. Access point from the supermarket parking lot. Well, it would bike either path. be oh, the bike path. It would either be, you know, and I'm not necessarily going to pretend I, I fully follow, but I think it would be for people coming either from here or, you know, that end up at this point, they could cross over into the onto the bike path, or people on the bike path that were too lazy to go all the way down to Main Street um, and had forgotten to turn off earlier here could, could cross over as well. Um, that may not be the most compelling of the reasons. People using the building that want to go for a walk or want to go back door. Exactly. Or, I mean, it's just, it, it's a break. It doesn't seem to be, um, I think it helps with the circulation. Would there be any safety concerns because of the corner there that goes into the parking lot? So, for example, and, and this is an honest question, an engineering question for, for those of you who can answer it, if a car comes out of the parking lot like this, is this too short of a sight distance to be safe? Or is there probably going to be a stop sign here? 
not coming out here. So the sorry, the pattern will they'll be going in this way. So right. cars yeah, won't, so yeah, it won't be an right. issue. Yeah, was okay. one way in and one way out. Okay. I missed the flow diagram. Okay. That answers that question. Thank you. We support. Um, I mean, I, uh, my inclination is not to allow this to simply sort of linger as a possibility, but um, to either say this is something we're going to require or or not. If we don't require it, it's not that it closes the door on this as a possibility. It just doesn't mean, means they don't have to have it. Well, as wait, who, who owns that land? The city? Mm -hmm. the street would be the city. Yes. Oh, yes, yeah, it's the city's responsibility. It's not the, not the people building the building. No, I understand, but they're coming in as co-applicants. Um, I don't feel the need to require it. Okay. Just because I don't have enough information, if yeah, it becomes I useful later. I, I, I agree with Kate. I, yeah. I, mean, I don't have enough information. I don't want to rely on my imagination. <laughs> Well, I don't think this isn't some bike <laughs> path. Just put a waste yeah, of effort. Some bike path. It doesn't turn out to be the right place. Yeah, exactly. Who the hell knows? I mean, let's not try to, let's not try to, you know, make a guess as to what yeah. what's going to work. You know, DPW can, you know, it takes months into the, well, the big boys. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's the city. It, 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 I think it's largely the city's property, given that they're already going to, it's yeah. not going to be a curbing issue from your house. Follow the goat paths. After two years of use, you'll see where people cut through, and then you'll know. That's right. That's pretty much it. Yeah. And you'll know whether to pave it or whether to keep a crushed stone in order to get water penetrate. You know, who the heck knows what the issues are? We're getting pretty close to the birds out back here. Yeah. Okay. All right. On that note, let's move on to lighting. I mean, no, it's a landscaping. Sorry. Um. <clears throat> so there's a landscape and lighting plan. Um, Let's take up the lighting first. Has everyone had an opportunity to look at the Du Bois and King um, lighting plan as well as the foot candle impact? Um, they answered some of the questions that we had, specifically Du Bois and King uh, asked, you know, whether the, the light post could be shorter, um, and they're saying, well, it won't match the one Taylor Street if we do, um, and not being able to place poles along the entire length of both north and east side of the parking lot if we lower it, lowering the luminaire mounting height by just a few feet significantly reduces the distance the light covers, resulting in the need for more fixtures. Use of 18-foot poles benefits the site by adequately lighting the lot with only three poles for the owner to maintain and operate. I think we have, for the first time, uh, a virtual reality version of what this will look like. Um, and the, the light poles along the bike path, that's a separate project. That's not anything we're considering tonight. Correct. We're just looking at these three light posts, one on the, one on the back side and one next to the island and then one across. Any questions about the light? But how about the landscaping? We've got the plant schedule. Non-invasives. Some service berry, some witch hazel, paper birch, choke berry. And the good old beloved boxwood. Um, you wouldn't have any problem if we make as this explicit condition that the maintenance and care of this landscape is part of the obligations under the permit. Um, it's a standard condition that we put in. Obviously, I don't think you want it, but we really don't want, you know, the, the sort of misused or abandoned island of uh, uncared for. 
plants. Oh, and the blast plants. Yes. Um, Keck Circle was like that until a few years ago. So we did Any question on that? Good. Okay. Um, and I think, Sarah, we had another uh, question about the about the planting of the trees. Um, I'm looking at page 17. Yeah. So the um, only outstanding thing that I in uh, the landscaping provisions are that. I think the the location and quantity all satisfy the requirements. We're just unsure um, at still of the overall size. The ordinance requires they um, delineate the difference between um, shrubs and small trees and medium trees and large trees. And this one particular provision regarding parking lot landscaping or um, specifies that they need to be medium or large trees and so we just that information is still unknown um, it could be written in as a condition to require that the trees be medium or, or um, large I think it's their overall like a mature height and the caliber that they're planted at it's a pleasure of the board Being too picky. Okay. We, yeah, we also have um, evidence from the landscape architect that it would be challenging to plant the trees as required because of the overhead lines. <laughs> I'm sorry, did you just say that? Um, well, the overhead lines I think are good because um, it just based on the over the height of the utility lines that it allows for small trees mm -hmm. um, but the one that I had a question on was just the parking lot requirements and it explicitly requires that trees be medium or large mm -hmm. um, and we're just unsure because depending on if they're medium they're presumed to shade this percentage of the parking lot and if they're large they're presumed to provide a certain square feet of um, shade so it's just unknown how the parking lot's required to be 25% shaded or presumed to be shaded, and it's just unknown what that percentage is. And maybe you have the information. So we do have all yeah. of those sizes mm -hmm. and that, that uh, our landscape architect has worked through. So certainly having that condition to show those sizes on the site plan is, mm -hmm. is, is, is easy enough and acceptable. Mm -hmm. We have some large trees. Some of these are. 75 feet, 60 to 75 feet, there's some medium size and there's some small. So there's a mix of the trees in the So we're absolutely good that on the final side. Anything further on the trees? I, I think, uh, and I was just skipping through the staff comments, I think we covered most of them as far as the lighting goes with the, with the memo, um, but there was one other outstanding point that on page 21 uh, about the dimmable function, which according to the electrical designer, fully dimmable, and we had a question about this. This was one of the um, representations that these lights were fully dimmable. And the testimony from the electrical designers that fully dimmable is meant to convey to the reviewer that these fixtures have the integral feature of being dimmable. This manufacturer has indicated on their cut sheets integral uh, that the integral 20, 120 volt through 277 volt electronic LED driver has zero to 10 volt dimming. Typically, what is meant is that these fixtures have the ability to dim down to 10% of full output. So they become activated when there's motion in the area. Is that the idea? The, uh, the way that it was explained to me, as I asked her for some plain English. I was just going to ask for a translation <laughs> of what I just read. So, so big picture is this. The, the lights are, are connected you know, through the building circuitry. And, mm -hmm. and there will be a small programming box within the, the new building. Okay? And so these, these lights you know, can be and will be programmed. So they turn on and off in the normal fashion of, of 
the, the, the dimming of the, of the sun and stuff like that. Well, when they're programmed, we can we can program them to to at, at certain times, I don't know, one o'clock, one a.m., midnight, something like that, to go from whatever light brightness that you know is deemed appropriate, from 100% full brightness down to something to 10%. Mm -hmm. So you know these plans don't indicate what that program will be. We're just saying that they have that ability, and it will be set up in a controller with a CPU that will be mounted somewhere. In, in the it's not a motion sensor. It would be more of a, a programmable. Programmable. Right. Yeah. It's not motion sensing. It's like so so Saturdays different from Mondays, different than Mondays in December. Than Correct. You know, Tuesdays exactly in July. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the and I, I don't mean to speak for the board if your thought has changed, but I, I got the sense last time that we were of the mind that um, this was not necessarily one of those areas that we were overly concerned with as far as the lighting and brightness, given that it's in the downtown. It's not necessarily near residential. Well, we're doing a great job of renovating some apartments up above. Across the street in the Obershaw and stuff, how that bright light bothers you all night long, you can go talk to the owner. That gives the flexibility. I, I think that I think that's true. I think that that once again, you know, we, I don't think we want to be making conditions as to a situation that we can we can't really anticipate fully. But the fact that the technology allows for modifications gives us some assurance that. Jack's scenario could be addressed. They're giving us everything that a normal person around can solve a problem with. And that's what the lighting does. That they've proposed to us. Right. They solve the problem. You know, as opposed to like the Department of Labor or the yeah. illuminated sign out on <laughs> River Street. Um, or you know, Cody that, Chevrolet or <laughs> I mean that, that that is likely to shine directly into right residential this doesn't seem this seems like something where yes they can do it on an as needed basis based on feedback from either neighbors or the city yeah. or other issues as opposed to um, having us say it must dim by right. a certain hour cool. it's probably with new technology mm -hmm. probably nowhere else in the city we require this to occur but now with LEDs you right. have that ability right mm -hmm. Like partial sodium metal halide, you can't dim it. Right. Right. So they're either on or they're off. Right. So that's that's what the, the manufacturer, the fixture, was just saying, gives you this flexibility of being able to actually yeah. dim it. It is kind of interesting. It is. It is. And I, I think, you know, we were looking at it in the context of what we're required to do, which is, you know, whether we should have any shut off time or, you know, it would be great if, I mean, this is a great technology. For some of, uh, for another project that faces a residential, where we could require dimming at a certain hour. And you also got to look at the neighbors, what's around this particular area. And if you've got other businesses with umpteen lights right. that are on all night, it's not going to have much effect. But I think the the sodium lights over at Shaw's will. Be <laughs> going to light them. So. Um, okay. I think that's it. Is that fair? Was there anything else? Yeah. Yeah, those were the only things uh, left outstanding. So what's what's the pleasure of the board? Um, we've got, just for review, we're looking at the site plan review, design review, demolition, and do we vote on the lot line adjustment? Um, yeah, it's coming to you as a package. So. Yeah. So we've essentially got four issues to vote on. Um, well, so Sarah has also uh, um, recommended uh, a number of conditions of approval, and I think we've discussed them. Uh, the one addition would be Kevin's words for the bike rack. Um, and I don't know if we <coughs> vote on everything at one voter or, 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 or we can we can do it 
as one vote, we can break it down into the four components. Uh, we can also take it under advisement. I mean, I think this is something we'll probably have to write out anyway, given the number of conditions. So we could just simply take it under advisement, let these good people go home, um, and have a, a decision forthcoming. Um, we do have time for your decision. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would support that as a as an approach, so we could be more deliberative in our, okay. in our uh, decision making. So I'll take that as a motion from Kevin to go into deliberative <laughs> to close the record, go into deliberative session. I'll second. Vote by Kevin. Second, James. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Record is closed. We're going to go into deliberative session. Notwithstanding not the deliberative session process, is there any reason why we should be concerned that the permit will not be approved? Well, yeah, you know, I'm I haven't more heard anything from the conversation, but we'd like to know where we stand to the extent that we can. We don't normally throw curve. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I think you've heard the board. I, I don't. In, in past experience, um, when when there's been an issue, it's usually been very well articulated. I think it's just that this is a new I process. Just, um, we have private applicants here too. I wanted to make sure. Yeah, no, I don't think this is this is being driven by either the complexity of the application overall or by any particular challenges. I think we just simply want to write it out under the new zoning bylaws, if that gives you. Enough of a weather report. Mr. Chair, when you say write it out, do you mean the specific conditions that will be right. attached based yeah. on, and I mean, most likely based on the staff report that we've all seen? Right, and what we've discussed here too far. Um, okay. You know, I, I think Jack's accurate. We as a board don't tend to throw curveballs. We, we don't tend to hide issues um, if we have them. That we raise them. Uh, my only suggestion is if you can make it clear to what the city will control and what yes. uh, the private will be controlled so that you don't mix um, requirements on us on city property and vice versa that's that's, that's a all. that's a fair um, yeah. that's a fair suggestion I think that's that's a good one so if you're going to do that then, then it's very clear that's all that's why the question you asked is that who's going to answer is it right I'm not going to impose something on you that you can't control right. that's no, not but, fair yeah, but Jay, Jay's, Jay's suggestion is, I think, a well taken and, and augurs towards writing it out as opposed to sort of throwing it then if back wrong, at it. Then we can look at it and come up with it and we're wrong and we can get, get things fixed, but I think we'll get it right. We have and do you have your deliberative as part of this meeting here? This yes, we'll, so, so just from a process point of view, what will happen is we'll, we'll go into deliberative session, um, discuss it, take a vote. Um, and uh, start to write out a decision in the next couple days um, that will be signed and then issued um, that will contain our findings, conditions, conclusions, um, and if presuming that the permits are granted, then that would be your permit. And the 30 days would run from the, the time that that permit is issued. Is, is it the practice that all the board members sign that, or just the chair? Just the chair. Just chair. Um, reflecting the vote taken. Sure. Anything else? Well, thank you all very much for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Could I recommend a five-minute break? I will um, hear that five-minute break. And then, um, before you break, and adjourn and then entertain a motion to adjourn. You, why don't we do that? Why don't we do the motion to adjourn? And then um, I'll just simply make as a note: our next regularly scheduled meeting is Monday, April second, two thousand eighteen, at seven p.m. Um, and I'll take Jack's motion to adjourn. Second. Second by Roger. Uh, any further? Um, discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye or raise your right hand. Aye. We are adjourned.